Kevin here. I am your host of the Myo Minute, and I'm an online myofunctional therapist, so I'm really happy you're here. In this video, you're actually going to get uh, dropped right into a lecture that I recently did about uh, tongue ties. So uh, unbeknownst to many of you, we do not diagnose a tongue tie based on appearance. It's really about the symptoms and the other, you know, the big picture of myofunctional impairment. So um, I recently had to do this lecture virtually, of course, because of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and it turned out great. So I thought it would be great to share it with you. Remember, uh, walk yourself through all of these questions and you're going to learn a lot. So I'm glad you're here. Make sure you subscribe to us so that you always find out when we have a new video. And I'm going to connect you to my lecture. I will see you in the next episode of the Myo Minute. All right. Thank you guys for having me. I feel like we're kind of having to punt making changes here at the last minute to do this lecture virtually rather than with the fancy PowerPoint and all of that, but that's okay. We're going to get through it. So um, for those of you who do not know me, let me just give you an introduction. I, I am Carmen Woodland. I am a myofunctional therapist and I have a large online global practice. Um, so I see all of my clients virtually. So today we're going to be talking about the big topic of do I have a tongue tie? And I'm going to literally be walking down um, what I call my discovery checklist. So you who are participating in this live with me, you already have some, um, some tools that will be really helpful. So hopefully you already have your um, getting started guide, your breathing assessment guide, and then also your own copy of the discovery checklist. Uh, so I am going to be just starting at the top. The most important thing when I go through this, when I'm doing this live with somebody, I'm trying to give dig information up. I'm trying to find all of the things that make me say, uh, yeah, you do have a tongue tie. Remember, a tongue tie is not diagnosed by the appearance. Now, I totally get that there are plenty of tongue ties that are obvious, okay? But a large majority of the population that I work with, these people have no idea. So, uh, but that's not how, how we're supposed to do it. We need to look at the big picture, the myofunctional impairment. And that's what a lot of these things on my discovery checklist, that just helps me say, okay, this person has this going on and this going on and this going on. At the end of the day, at the end of the exam, when somebody has a comprehensive exam with me, what I am working to figure out is, do they have a tie? If they do, how significant, you know, what role is it playing here? But most important, I'm looking at the big myofunctional impairment window. So that's what we're looking at. Um, all of these things are just digging. They're just probing questions. So when somebody does the discovery checklist, they might check off a ton of things. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's getting worse and worse and worse. It's just more supportive of, yeah, I have a concern here. So I'm going to just jump right in since we have X amount of time and since we have decided to, to um, do this lecture virtually rather than me traveling to you. Um, let's just get started. So first, let's talk about the, the first area here, which says infancy and early childhood. People are always taken aback when I say I'm going to ask you questions all the way back to your childhood. If you have a tongue tie, it's been there since uh, about halfway through your mom's pregnancy. So you've had it your whole life. Very often, though, people don't realize that the symptoms that they have, that kind of stuff, um, aren't really normal. So they only know what their normal is, okay? Um, so when I list all of these questions, one of the biggest things, the first things that I ask uh, a client is, do you, what do you remember about your childhood? Were you happy, sad? Did you spit up a lot? Were you gassy? I mean, my goodness, I've had clients whose parents had to prop them up in the corner of the crib because they had acid reflux. So those type of things. The first thing really I want to know is, were you breastfed or bottle fed? And a lot of people will say, I was breastfed, no problems. A lot of people say, will say, I was breastfed, uh, for a short amount of time, but my mom switched to bottle feeding. I'm always curious why mom switched to bottle feeding. Was it because you couldn't nurse adequately? Is it because it was painful? It was miserable. She had 
cracked and bleeding nipples. I mean, come on, the list goes on and on. Uh, or was it a supply issue? And if it was a supply issue, is that because there wasn't adequate milk transfer because you have a tongue tie and you couldn't do it well? So we're digging, digging, digging. A lot of people will say, Carmen, my mom just bottle fed because that's what she did. Okay, so that just, that answers that. Um, some people will say, my mom uh, breastfed me for a little while, but she went back to work and so I got switched to the bottle. I can tell you this. Uh, you know, not getting into the politics of breastfeeding and all of that stuff. We know it's more nutritional, all of that. But as far as cranial facial development and uh, a tongue thrust, if somebody was bottle fed, the longer the better because the tongue has to go up and work. So to express that milk, the tongue has to go up and work really hard. And that's strength building, you guys. It also helps spread the maxilla, which the that helps make the face wider, the, the maxilla is the middle of the face, that helps make the middle of the face wider, it brings down the ceiling so that person doesn't tend to be so high and narrow. So it helps craniofacial development because the jaw is going to follow that, uh, the, it's going to follow the maxilla in development, okay? Um, the other thing that a lot of people get interested about is... Um, you know, they'll say, well, nope, I was a happy baby. My mom said I just slept all the time. I would fall asleep at the breast and I was just lovely. Sounds like that person is lovely. However, that also can mean that there's a tongue tie because nursing is exhausting. So in a child who, um, who continually falls asleep and um, falls asleep they wake up, they have a snack. It's exhausting. They fall asleep, they have a snack. It's exhausting. That is a big red flag. And a lot of people don't realize that. So that's why I ask these weird questions. Um, so trouble with reflux, colic, spit up, gassy. Those are all things saying, eh, there's a concern here. Uh, one question I do always ask is, do, did you have a history of ear infections or did you have tubes placed? And, and people are always interested in why I asked the, this question. So again, remember, I'm digging for information to support, yes, I think this person has a tongue tie. This is long before I even get to the functional assessment. I'm, I'm supporting my thought process before I even start looking at your tongue or your photos, okay? So the whole thing with ear infections, if you don't swallow properly, there's a high chance that your eustachian tubes do not drain properly. So if you swallow and you hear a click, that's your eustachian tubes. But a lot of people have trouble, so they have um, a lot, a high incidence of infection, uh, ear infection, and I, I mean, I've had clients who have had five sets of tubes in their ears, so that's why I ask that question. Um, difficulty transitioning to solid foods. Um, I ask about choking, gagging, coughing when eating. I mean, those are all things that are just saying, eh, things aren't running so smoothly here. I know I've shared the story of my granddaughter with you guys over and over again uh, out on social media, and it's really why I why I do what I do because um, she she would gag. Often, very often, if you think about it, if your tongue is tied down, it's hard to manipulate the tongue. It, it can't be the tool. It is meant to help you chew bilaterally, which obviously babies aren't chewing, but as they start to transition to solid foods, that's hard. Um, but the tool, the tongue is supposed to be a tool to help you chew. It's supposed to be a tool to help you keep the food on the occlusal surface, so on the chewing surface of the teeth. When you have a tongue tie and you can't do that, Food gets down in areas that um, tend to bother people, cause them to gag. A weak tongue, you know, weak muscles can cause gagging. So there's so many different issues. But in my granddaughter's instance, that food would get down like alongside her tongue and it just, it would kind of make her cough and choke a little bit and then she would get sick and vomit. So those are things that some people think is just their normal. But for us as myofunctional therapists, that's a big red flag. So that kind of wraps up the child and inf uh, early childhood and infancy section, okay? B basically, by those questions, I have gotten 
what I need to know. Next is airway and breathing concerns. So it talks about asthma, allergies, congestion. Um, really, at the end of the day, I'm trying to figure out what kind of breathing issues you're having. If you're nasal breathing, if you're mouth breathing, uh, is there a congestion issue? So before I forget, let me talk about the, the breathing assessment guide. The most important thing when I start into this with somebody in, in this section is knowing whether or not they can nasal breathe. Because if you can't nasal breathe, if you have a physical barrier, a deviated septum, um, swollen turbinates, you've got polyps, I mean, anything like that, that's going to make it impossible for you to learn to nasal breathe, which is one of the parts of my job. So when somebody has that kind of physical barrier, that requires an ENT. You know, somebody needs to help you. A lot of people who, who come to me and I meet, they say, oh yeah, 20 years ago I was told I have a terrible deviated septum and I need to do something about it. Or I've had um, severe sinus issues my whole life. I'm supposed to do surgery, but I'm not super excited about it. At that time, that's when I'm saying, well, you're going to have to do something about it because it's going to impede our success. Now, I will tell you this. If you can nasal breathe for a minute, you can nasal breathe for life. It's just hard getting breaking that cycle. Uh, and one of the hardest things is chronic congestion. And sometimes you're contributing to that factor. Sometimes you eat things. You have a very high inflammatory diet. You do things you know you're not supposed to do, but you do it anyhow. And so at that time, when I'm working with clients and they've paid me for therapy, I'm saying, okay, so why? Why We're spinning our wheels. You have to help in this process. So that's really something to think about. Chronic congestion can also come from mouth breathing. So again, it's, it's um, breaking that vicious cycle. Now, on this sheet, I talk about um, like the percentage of mouth breathing, the percentage of nasal breathing. A lot of people nasal breathe during the day and they mouth breathe at night, and that's okay. That is one of the things that we eventually fix, but it takes time. It takes strength of the muscles. It takes um, awareness and habit correction. So the other thing that I really focus on when I am educating somebody or when I'm in therapy with somebody is the whole notion of incorrect breathing. So I want to touch on that here just a minute because I've got a captive audience. Uh, if you are mouth breathing or, you know, that real shallow um, thoracic chest breathing, then you are in constant fight or flight mode. So you're stimulating a paras or a sympathetic nervous system response versus, which is that running from that saber tooth tiger trying to get away versus a parasympathetic, which is that rest and digest, that calming. Um, those those nerve fibers use different parts of the lungs when breathing. So if you're mouth breathing and you're doing this, first of all, you're shallow breathing. You're not using your diaphragm at all. And then you are, you're, so you're getting less oxygen, but you're using just the upper portion of your lungs. So you really want to be able to use that lower portion. That's where those parasympathetic nerve fibers are and be able to belly breathe. So um, here in just a second, we're going to be talking about digestive issues, but I like to set the tone here for people who come to me and they, first of all, either don't believe or they, they just, um, they don't know that there's a connection between breathing and digestion. But first of all, when you're mouth breathing and you're in that freak out fight or flight running from that saber tooth tiger mode, do you think that your body is caring about digesting your burrito? Nope, not happening. Uh, so it's worried about the fact that your legs have a blood supply and that your muscles can can run and run away and jump that wall or any, you know, that. Um, but when you are mouth or when you're nasal breathing, you are, first of all, you're using your breathing, you're using your lungs correctly. I mean, we all need that, that fight or flight and the parasympathetic. So we need that balance because you do want to be able to say, oh, this is a scary situation. I need to make it through, but, but you need some balance. But when people aren't belly breathing, which is the correct way, 
you're not using the diaphragm, which is a muscle, and it is supposed to go, uh, your belly is supposed to go in and out, if you will, instead of your shoulders going up and down. So I want you to breathe um, horizontally rather than vertically. So that's really important. But the diaphragm is a muscle, you guys, and it is a muscle that you want to use it so you don't lose it. And when you eat pro or when you breathe properly, that muscle, it does this, but when you exhale and it deflates, it also um, massages digestive organs. So like your transverse colons there, it, uh, a lot of people, when they're breathing correctly, they say, oh my gosh, I can't believe the changes in my digestive issues. So I always like to tie that in. I know we're going to talk about digestion here in a minute, but that's really, really important to consider that. Okay. Um, so the other thing I will say about breathing before I move on, if you're not a good breather, go out there on the internet. I mean, this is something that I teach when I work with complex clients. Um, but most of the time I don't work with people that long. And so I tell people, go out there on the internet, read books, understand Buteco breathing, um, look up Ed Harold. Like there's a lot of stuff out there for breathing. And many of you guys already know this because I myself don't breathe well. Um, or I, I'm improving, I'm a work in progress, but it's super important to get your breathing down. If you're over breathing, you don't want to be doing that. That's excess work on your body, um, but it really improves your health. Okay, so let's next move on to the next session or next segment of the discovery checklist, which says oral resting posture. So I just jumped right in here and I didn't talk about the four goals of myofunctional therapy. So let me just do that real quick. So when I work with somebody, I, I, I get thrown so many things at me and I have to stay very focused that this is my lane. This is what I work with. So that's um, correct tongue posture, which is in the roof of the mouth, the whole tongue in the roof of the mouth. Okay. Not just the tip, uh, correct oral rest posture. So that's mouth closed lips together. I like your teeth to just gently, like just be a millimeter apart. I don't want them clenched together. I don't want them gaping open because um, some people will close their, uh, their lips, but on the inside, their teeth are open. Your back teeth will continue to erupt because they're always looking for a partner. So if that happens, pretty soon you have an open bite. You can't bite into a sandwich because your front teeth don't touch. And that's because your back teeth you've been open so much that they have grown, they have super erupted to t find something else to touch. Um, and so open, so oral resting posture. The third one is that you are nasal breathing. And um, that is nasal breathing, except when you're super duper sick. I mean, we've all been there where we have no choice except to mouth breathe. And then when you're working out really hard, but I do challenge you to work out as long as you can before reverting to mouth breathing because it's better for you. Uh, so next I am talking about oral rest posture. This generally is, is kind of a given. Um, when we get to this part of the exam, you know, we talk about whether the tongue pushes on the teeth. Is it in the floor of the mouth? Is the tip up? Um, are the lips sealed? Are they parted? The most important thing, the longer that your, um, the longer that your mouth is open and the lips are apart, I mean, that's the incorrect oral rest posture, but there's consequences with that too. So when your lips are closed, they, they help the teeth not be big old buck teeth. So that's helpful. So when I talk with somebody about this and I say, okay, so stop right now. So as you're doing this, you can just kind of think about it. Where is your tongue at rest? So for a lot of people, it's pushing uh, on the teeth somewhere. For some people, I have some people that are biting on it. The most concerning thing about your tongue is, or I should say the most damaging, it, a lot of people think it's the tongue thrust, which can push on the teeth. But where your tongue rests, that constant pressure is more concerning than the intermittent uh, forces of that swallow. So tuning into where your tongue is, is super important. The correct tongue posture needs to be all the way in the roof of the mouth. And when I say all the way up there, I mean, it's like if you were to press a piece of Wonder Bread into the roof of your mouth, that's what I mean. 
Okay, moving on. So now we're talking about those digestive issues, okay? Um, this is a huge second segment of my population that have these digestive issues. So I always tell people, if you have myofunctional, if you have digestive issues that are related to myofunctional impairment, you're going to see improvement. If it's related to something else, like for example, I have somebody who she ha uh, takes a diabetic medication and one of the side effects is a stomach ache, that you wouldn't expect to change because they're not changing the medicine, okay? Uh, so that's what we're looking for. A large reason why I have people with digestive issues that are related to a tongue tie is um, they don't chew and swallow crocodile properly. They don't chew bilaterally, which is on both sides. They don't chew adequately because a lot of people with a tongue tie, eating is not enjoyable to them. They're tired. It's like working against um, like those elastic workout bands. So they don't want to chew hard to chew things. So they're picky or they hate textures. Uh, they don't want to chew it long enough. I mean, I've even had clients down to age five say, I chew just enough so that I don't choke. Okay. So hence digestive issues. Um, and so that's really, really common. So whether you have reflux that's medicated or unmedicated, so many of you guys are medicating for reflux. You totally forget that you even take that medication. It's a bandaid on a bullet wound, myofunctional therapy and myofunctional therapists. That's what we do. We help you find the root cause resolution, like what's causing this, okay? Another big thing for acid reflux is sleep apnea. So many people, they just medicate for it, but they, but they never dig any deeper. So, um, so there's a lot of questions about digestion on this checklist. Um, so I always ask people, do you have hiccuping, belching, burping, bloating, gas, um, you know, so people generally have something there. Um, constipation, we talk about um, slow eating versus fast eating. So a lot of my clients who have digest digestive issues, they, um, they don't want to chew and they eat in a hurry because they hate it. They don't enjoy it. It's a chore. I have some clients as old as 40 that choose their food based on how difficult it is to chew. Some people, they're not going to touch a pork chop. I have some people who will not eat salads because it, it manipulating the food is just very difficult. Um, so another thing that I go through when I'm doing a comprehensive exam with somebody is I evaluate their chewing. Um, I evaluate their swallowing, how they swallow liquid, how they swallow a cracker, the bottom line is, you guys, that your tongue is supposed to work in a nice wave. Now, the correct swallow is the tongue going to the roof of the mouth where it creates a suction. And that suction helps change the pressure in the mouth, which helps propel pull the food, you know, towards the throat. So that chewed up food is called a bolus. So a lot of people, they have no idea that they're finding other ways to change the swallow. And that very often is the face muscles, the lips, the, the tongue thrusting. I mean, there's all, everybody's a little bit different, but I have clients who use their face muscles here so much to help swallow, or even they have to kind of tip their head back that I have some clients who look like they smoke a pack a day because they use their lips to help. They get really deep wrinkles here. A lot of people use their chin. So I can watch people swallow. And if you if you swallow and you don't look nice, like nice and steady, like when I swallow, you're only going to see this. You don't know that I swallow. But I have clients who they have to chicken neck. They have to wash their food down with liquids. Those are things that you might be doing that's totally your normal. And until your husband points it out or I point it out, you don't realize that it's not normal, okay? Um, another thing that I talk about here on this checklist is um, using liquids to swallow. A lot of people do that. They don't know. And open mouth or chewing with their open mouth. So a lot of people think this is manners. You know, people will say, oh, heck no. My mom told me you're not eating at this table unless you're chewing with your mouth closed. 
But what people don't understand is it's not that, that Johnny is trying to be a pig. It's that Johnny wants to breathe and enjoy his pizza at the same time. So he has to open his mouth. So if you're a parent and you're experiencing that with your child, uh, that should be a clue that they've got congestion issues. You know, this is a big snowball. As I go through this with you guys, you're learning that a lot of this stuff is like this. It's all connected. And the snowball just gets bigger and bigger. Um, choking is a big thing. So many of you choke and you just think that that's just how I am. But what I do want to tell you is you're here listening to this today and it is so much easier to correct it now than when you're older. I have shared this very openly that I have a large population of clients from 60 to my oldest right now is 79. It is so stinking hard to help somebody at that age who has been swallowing wrong since birth, since before birth and to try and correct that. You guys, it takes a lot of elbow grease. So if you're somebody who chokes uh, and you don't know why, and that's always just kind of been, I want you to dig a little bit deeper. Okay. Um, let me see what else here. So we already, we already talked about gag reflex textures. Um, Again, prefer soft, easy to chew food. That goes back to being my lazy eaters. So many people, when they fill this out for me and they, they put these check marks, they say, you know, that they eat fast, that they chew soft foods, all of those things. And this is adults. They can look back to when they were children and their mom will say, oh, yeah, Levi would only eat a chicken nugget or he would only eat yogurt or applesauce, that kind of stuff. So that's what I'm looking at there. So um, the thing, the last thing I want to talk about with digestive issues when it comes to myofunctional therapy, some people experience this immediately. Um, I've had clients who have a phrenectomy done and literally the same day their chronic constipation goes away. Uh, I have some people, it takes a little bit longer. I have have often shared my story about my most successful digestive case was a little girl who not only took a prescription med, but ate like half a bottle of antacids a day. It took from July till December to totally have her off of her meds. And really all her mom wanted to gain from therapy with me was to get her off the antacids. And in the end, we got her off of everything 100%, which is always my goal going back to that, you know, finding the root cause resolution, but it takes a little bit of time. So that's one thing that is going to vary with clients. And if you move on to myofunctional therapy, the same thing's going to happen with you. And so I have my clients uh, record symptoms, you know, keep track because in a busy society, we tend to overlook that we're getting improvement. So some people have it right away, and then other people, it takes a little bit longer. Um, all right, the next thing that I, I ask about on here is tongue tie history. So if you're telling me that you have had a phrenectomy before, depending on your age, a lot of the time I assume it probably wasn't done right, probably wasn't done with myofunctional therapy, and therefore we're probably starting over. And most people, when they find me and they go through this process with me, they're, they're, they're okay with that. It's not the end of the world. We're not chopping off limbs. It's a little uncomfortable for a couple days, but going back through it again and doing it right, that's the important thing. Now, with that said, I have met children, and so parents, I am totally speaking to you right here. Uh, if you have a child who had it done as an infant, I mean, I, you guys, I have had parents in front of me, they have a child whose tongue is almost anchored to the floor of the mouth. And the parents will say, yeah, Carmen, yep, he had a tongue tie, but he had it taken care of. That doesn't mean that just because it was done, that it's done right. Okay, I am just throwing that out there. And I piss off a lot of parents because I tell them, Yep, it was done. And for an infant, very often it's just the very anterior is released. It's not completely done, especially on the age. If somebody is 60 years old and they had a phrenectomy as a child, first of all, I'm surprised that they did. And second of all, I, I'm almost willing to bet the farm that it wasn't done correct. Okay, so that's what that tells me. If somebody tells me, yeah, I had a phrenectomy done before, I know um, 
that there's myofunctional impairment, especially if they didn't do myofunctional therapy. And realistically, why are they in front of me, right? If we're talking and having this conversation and they've done this discovery checklist, they clearly think they have some issues. Um, okay, next, let's talk about oral habits. So, um, I, so I ask them, finger sucking, prolonged pacifier use, any other habits. The bottom line is, you guys, when I talk about correct tongue posture, correct mouth posture, correct swallow. None of that can happen if there's a darn thing in the mouth. I don't care if it's a thumb, a finger, a pacifier, a bottle. Um, I've, I've had children who chew on their coat, you know, like on the, the collar of their coat. I've had a child who has trouble putting rocks in his mouth. Nothing should be in the mouth. And, and so that's why we develop tongue thrust swallowing patterns is because any child, whether if you think about a, a thumb being in the mouth, if you think about a nipple or a pacifier being in the mouth, it's pinning the tongue down. So the tongue is not allowed to do this movement. And so when you swallow 1,200 to 2,000 times a day, do you think that you take the pacifier out? Do you think that you take the thumb out or the finger or the rock or insert whatever it is here? Absolutely not. So this is why we have that, uh, that concern. A child by the age of three should be swallowing like an adult. So if your child is six and is such a messy eater and, you know, has to poke food back into the mouth, anything that seems out of the norm, you got to dig into, you know, and if it's for you yourself and you start looking back going, oh my gosh, this is what I considered normal. It's not. I tell people all the time, you don't know something's broken until it's broken. Now, one thing about um, swallowing and tongue thrust is I, I will tell people this all the time. If you have a tongue tie, 100% you do not swallow right. You may not realize that and you might say, well, Carmen, I haven't starved, so I'm doing okay. And you might be doing fine until you're 70 or 80 or 50. At some point, your body gets tired of helping you out. The, the same thing can be said for if you have, like, say your right, um, your right knee is bad and you're gimping along. Do you not think that at some point your left hip or your left lower back, the body's going to get tired of compensating, so something is going to give. And that's what happens is I get so many clients in that 60 to, you know, 79 range where they say, Carmen, nothing is different. And suddenly I'm choking on everything. And so they go to their doctor and the doctor is, you know, scratching their head because nothing has changed. Well, yeah, everything has changed. It's because your body is sick and tired of helping you along. So if this is you, you want to fix it now. You don't want to wait until you're older. Okay, I'm going to get off my high horse. Now let's talk about uh, dental. So I have this dental section here where we're talking, where I ask about things like uh, the teeth. Are they crowded? Uh, if you have listened to my lectures about the developing child, the craniofacial development, I can tell you this, that if, if teeth are crowded and you have a little one, then there's a concern because teeth are supposed to have spaces. And so the reason I ask about large spaces and adults really look at that like, yeah, I have gaps in my teeth. Well, that's better than them being too crowded because that means that there's more space. So we look at that. We talk about ortho in the past or now. You guys would be surprised at how many people. Um, first, let me talk about adults that come to me. They've been in ortho through their lifetime three and four times. They have spent a bazillion dollars doing this. I also have a lot of kiddos who, um, I, don't, I shouldn't say kiddos, I should say like late teens, early 20s. I have a lot of those who, like I have a, uh, somebody who is um, a junior in high school right now and has been, for as long as he can remember, has been in, in ortho. And so the biggest thing is, is why, why is it relapsing? 
Okay. Uh, there's a reason because those teeth weren't meant to be straight anyhow, because the face didn't develop properly. So those again are things that we're digging for. Um, does somebody have, did they have teeth expect, um, extracted out of the mouth to create space? So now we have a smaller mouth because when you take teeth out of a small mouth, you get a smaller mouth. And now we've got breathing issues and, you know, uh, where do I put the tongue? You know, all, all of those type of things. Um, if somebody has a lot of decay, that again, I talked about that tongue being a tool. If the tongue cannot clean the teeth, there's going to be a lot of cavities, okay? And I have people demonstrate, you know, can they reach and scrub like if they were scrubbing chocolate off their back molars without moving their chin? So that's one thing that you can watch because if you're moving your chin to help your tongue, that's compensation. So a lot of people who have a tongue tie, the chin and the tongue work uh together because they're tied together. And so the goal is, especially after that phrenectomy, is that we get them so that they can do things with their tongue without moving their jaw. Which, and I'll just jump to it now because it's on here somewhere, but uh, so jaw issues are one of the biggest things that is, is so expensive and so frustrating for people. Now, I am very limited in my scope of, you know, TMJ issues. And the reason that is, is because so many people come to me, uh, literally, you guys, I have seen people who have spent thousands and thousands, $50,000 plus on trying to get things figured out with the jaw. Let me tell you this. It is the most complex joint in the body. And that's what's so hard is people come to me, they have spent tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of dollars throwing money at this problem and nobody has ever lifted and looked under their tongue. And some of these people go to, I mean, they travel states away to see experts and specialists, but nobody looked under the tongue. So the tongue tie to me, that's low hanging fruit. I feel like we should be looking at that first. Um, the other thing is, is a lot of people have jaw issues. I mean, first of all, most complex joint in the body. And then when you start doing having the the this joint do the job of the tongue, um, that it becomes a repetitive stress injury. So for example, when I have my clients try and say uh, la 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 la, and they say la 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 la, there's a big difference it's because they're using this instead of the tongue being able to work independently. So when I was just talking about this. I want my clients to be able to work independently, la, 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 just like that. Um, and that, so that's, that's a tricky thing. Then I also have clients who have a tongue tie and there's a muscle, the styloglossus that goes from the tip of the tongue and it inserts back here by the joint. So very often that causes problems too. And until we get that released and in the proper position, that causes problems also. So that. That's probably one of the trickiest areas in my experience in myofunctional therapy is this joint because everybody wants an answer right now and it's just not possible um, for one thing, okay? Um, okay, so I jumped ahead. Let me make sure in dental that I touched on a lot of this stuff. Um, one thing that I do ask on here that I do want to address is uh, the use of a tongue crib or a, a, a past habit corrector. So many people come to me and they've had a tongue crib or they've had, um, you know, different, I'm telling you, there's all sorts of different creative options out there. But what happens when I have somebody come to me and they have a tongue crib, which is like, a rake. It's like spite. You know, anything that that creates a reason for the tongue not to come forward. This doesn't change your habit. It stops it momentarily, but it doesn't change your habit up here. And it creates another problem because not only do I now have somebody who is um, thrusting and their, their tongue wants to come forward, but they've also created another bad habit because if there's something that stops the tongue as it's coming forward, they, they've developed something different. So going back to that compensation that 
I now have to break that. So I hate these. I hate them. I hate them. It doesn't solve the problem at its root. Okay. So there I am getting fired up about that. Next, let's talk about speech. So I get asked a lot. And if you're watching this and you're a speech therapist, Bless you. I hope that you um, have the myofunctional therapy knowledge mixed with speech because that is badass, you guys. Um, I am limited. I, do, I can't do speech. And so somebody, a great speech therapist who has myo, like it, they're untouchable. And I, I love, 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 love that they combine the two. Um, but at the end of the day, Myofunctional therapy is not speech therapy, but so many people come to me and they've got children or they themselves have been in speech therapy for years and not one person has looked under their tongue. So this goes back to that low hanging fruit and me feeling so passionately. That's why I'm talking to you in this lecture today is if you work around the mouth, you have to look for these things. Speech therapists, dentists, hygienists. All of those people need to be looking for a tongue tie because it's the the low hanging fruit are the easy ones, um, but they also need to know the other risk factors and signs and symptoms so that they can get that person if it's not an obvious tie, so they can get them to somebody like me who can solve the problem. Okay, I'm part of the team. Um, but when somebody comes to me and they say I have a history of speech therapy. Um, a, a lot of times parents will say, well, Johnny's been in, in speech therapy for um, T, D, S, N, L. He has trouble with R's, you know, certain sounds. Then uh, that's a big red flag. But but Johnny's not making progress. Um, I've shared this very often publicly about my granddaughter. She had three years and it just pains me to know that nobody ever looked under her tongue. Um, she couldn't say ours. Instead of saying purple, she said poo poo. So, so many people, so many, so many people come to me and they say, I can't say ours. Uh, and so a lot of people get dismissed from therapy because the speech therapist gives up, the parents give up, um, or if they're in a school system, they just kind of move through the, the program and they get booted out essentially. So myofunctional therapy is going to help you um, or your child be successful, set your child up for success with speech therapy. Um, half of the muscles in the tongue are for the shape of the tongue and the other half are for the placement of the tongue. If the tongue can't get there and doesn't know how to operate properly, then that is why it's very, very difficult. So while I don't do speech therapy, I have many clients that once we get to a certain point, then I refer them. I will say to the mom, hey, so let's talk about that, um, that lisp that your child has. And it's incredible how, and it's so rewarding. I don't do the work, but I definitely take some of the credit for it when I have a child who I hear a, a speech problem and I talk with mom and I send them to somebody who helps them. And that's the other thing here. Um, so I ask about... Well, a lot of things with talking, but what I find, and this is why I'm throwing this out here now, is so many parents have no idea that their child has a speech impediment because they're used to it. They don't hear it. And so that's always a real delicate conversation when I have to say, so do you hear Jessica's lisp? Do you hear, you know... And some parents are like, whoa, no, I just love my child as they are. And that's hard. So it, but it's important to identify it. And, and I struggle with that with my own granddaughter because, so she was in speech, unsuccessful. Then she had her phrenectomy. Then she had, you know, therapy with me. And so now back working on speech stuff in school, she's in a position to be successful but it takes time, it takes effort, and it means that you also identify that that person has a, a concern. And so sometimes for me, when I talk with my granddaughter and, and we talk about that, you know, everybody just loves her as she is, but I do too. But I also don't want her to be saying poo-poo when she's 40. So it's it's getting, it's some very real conversations, okay? Um, I think that really sums it up with speech. Oh, one last thing. So 
somebody who talks really fast. Um, well, actually two things. So talking really fast, a lot of people, they have speech impediments, but they talk really fast so you won't catch them. So that's a thing. And then I have people who have like these meek little voices. They have been, um, they've been considered shy their whole life. I mean, there are social implications of having a tongue tie and you may not realize that, but you may have been called unapproachable. You may have been called an introvert. You may have been called rude. I've had ladies that say, you know what? I have been just called a bitch my whole life because I don't enjoy interacting with people. I don't like social settings. I don't want to go to that party and talk with anybody because God forbid I have trouble talking anyhow. It's tiring. It's exhausting. I don't enjoy it. And God forbid if I put a glass of wine on top of that, I really struggle. And so I have had two clients that I have worked with through therapy that both told me that they, um, a male and a female, they both said that they just had these meek voices that they used to get a lot of um, flack for um, not speaking up, talk louder, you know, one's dad used to yell at her. Uh, and so what I watched as I went through therapy with them is, I am not kidding you, I watched their personality change I watched their um, them just blossom. They had just been this little meek personality because they didn't enjoy conversing. They didn't want to have a conversation. And my gosh, I never told them what I was seeing until the very end. And it was, to me, it was amazing. And I, I absolutely loved it. Uh, okay, so a couple more areas here. Head and neck tension. This is so common. And the bottom line is, if you have a tongue tie, you have a structural issue, okay? And when you have that, it's like your shoulders are rolled forward. Your diaphragm is compressed. So going back to that diaphragm, what about that belly breathing? So, so many of you say, oh, yeah, I don't breathe well. Well, yeah, because you're rolled over. Um, that tension. So you everything is connected here. You have a bone here in your throat called the hyoid bone, which does not connect to anything, any other bony structure, but it connects to um, the floor of your mouth, to your clavicle, to your shoulder blade. There's nine muscles pulling that different directions. So it, it everything is connected here. If you do not have structural alignment, it's hard to feel comfortable. Some people always feel tense. Um, many of the exams that I would do with people, they send me pictures, you guys, and they look like this. That tension, yeah, it makes me tense looking at it. So. My goal is that you're structurally aligned, that your posture is not forward. I want your ears over your shoulders, but it takes a little bit of time to get there because if you have a tongue tie, you're doing this. And so if you're going to the massage therapist, if you're going to the chiropractor, if you're going to all of these specialists, week, I mean, I have clients that do all of this stuff weekly. You might be throwing money out the window because you aren't in a position to be corrected. So um, I have clients that get their release. Ladies cry, you know, because it's just that release. Um, some people say it's like cutting guitar strings. They just can feel that tension go away. Um, I've had one lady say, the bottom of my feet quit hurting. I had another lady say, I drove home from my appointment and I can actually feel my shoulder blades on the seat of my car. So going back to that comprehensive healthcare team that I talk about a lot, I'm just a piece of the puzzle. Posture, I mean, physical therapy, all of these things play into it. But at the end of the day, when somebody has chronic tension and it's just ruining their day, their life, um, headaches, tension headaches, um, helping figure out a way to solve that is so important. Now, let me touch on headaches here quick because a lot of people have headaches and then I get a lot of people have migraines. And I'm very, very careful when I'm working with somebody, especially because I'm a migraine sufferer myself. I never want you to think that this is going to solve a migraine issue. It may, but there are so many different causes of migraines. It can be hormones. It can be food. It can be sensitivities. It can be inflammation. It can be um, smells. I don't think I said smells. For me, it is structural alignment. So if I were somebody who had a tongue tie and suffered from migraines, it could be a concern. 
but I also never want somebody to come to me and feel like I'm selling them unicorn dust or fairy dust or whatever. I'm not a snake oil salesman. I'm very realistic. So when I have somebody come to me and they have migraine issues, I say, you know what? Hopefully we, we get some help there. But at the end of the day, those four goals that I'm talking about, that's still what I'm working towards. If the migraines help, great. Now, one thing that also causes a lot of facial tension, facial pain, um, is clenching and grinding. I'm always curious about that because it's like, okay, so why do you have this jaw pain? Why are you clenching and grinding? It's very common for somebody who has a tongue tie to clench and grind, but it also is the big red flag for sleep disordered breathing for an airway crisis. And that's one of the big things that is really the root of why I do what I do is because sleep disordered breathing, things like sleep apnea kills people. Okay. We're going to talk about sleep here in a minute. Um, the last thing I want to touch on in this session uh, if you're looking at your discovery checklist in the head and neck tension is, um, forward head posture. So that's another thing that, that I'm kind of digging. So remember, as I'm doing this, I'm digging for things that support. Yes. This person has a tongue tie. Yep. Nope. Yep. Nope. It's, it's like, I'm keeping a tally. Okay. Cause I want to support my decision. Every time I write my report, it's as if I'm on the phone with a doctor saying, yes, Tommy has a tongue tie and here's why, because this supports it and this and this and this. So that's the important thing. I always am supporting my decision. Um, forward head posture is, you know, when people start to get that, that dowager's hump, that, that, that hunch, that hump back. Uh, this is so important, you guys, to deal with because every for every inch forward that the head is, it puts 12 extra pounds on the spine. So we think that those little old ladies that are hunkered over, we think that's osteoporosis. And that's not the case, you guys. It's that forward head posture. And a lot of us, like we have to figure out why is that? So is it a structural alignment issue? Is it an airway issue? Because when you jut your head forward, you're making it easier for air. So I always say, if you look at a dog who is on four legs, when they breathe, it goes straight through their body, if you will. When we became bipedal people and we're upright, the air has to go in and make a 90 degree turn. So when you do this, it kind of changes that. So those are the things that we're looking at, okay? Um, all right, last, actually there's two sections here. Before I jump into sleep, let's talk about behavior challenges. So I ask here about sensory processing, oppositional defiance, hyperactivity or inattention. So this is hard because, you know, I get parents that say, well, um, my son is five and he is really hyper and he's really, you know, all of these things, but is it just because he's five? Um, many of you have children who maybe might be being medicated for um, hyperactivity, you know, think behavior issues, that kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, your child isn't sleeping. And so there are things that, um, that we really look for when we're talking about children, teeth grinding, um, bedwetting, diagnosis of ADHD. Do you know that there are some countries that will not allow you to label and medicate a child for ADHD until they have a sleep study. And we're not there yet. I, I hope that someday we, we are because I get so many parents who come to me. They say, I have a child who is missing more school by spending it in the, in the principal's office than in class, um, has airway issue, you know, has all of the concerns, and is just being medicated. And so that's what's hard with Western medicine is that we just start to medicate our children. So if you have a child that has behavior issues, there is a difference between being a normal five-year-old boy versus um, one that has concerns. So whether it's diagnosed or not, uh, be real. Think about that because some parents do get um, offensive over that. Now, um, if you're an adult, I have a lot of adults who have been medicating for years 
and they just, that's just their normal. And at the end of the day, they have sleep concerns. So I'm going to get ready to close up here with sleep. I feel like this is the most important area when I do this because I, I tell people the whole time I'm going through this exam, I'm looking to pass the buck. I'm looking for reasons to say, you need to see your doctor. You need a sleep study. And the reason that I call it passing the buck is because I want somebody else to stick their neck on the line to say that you're fine. And it just blows my mind how many people I send for a sleep study and they're, they're told, eh, you're fine. You don't have any risk factors. We don't need to do a sleep study. Sleep study, you guys, is not limited to the middle-aged fat man with a big neck. It's failure to thrive, and it's in our little kids. When kids don't sleep well, they don't get a, a human growth hormone, so they might just be puny little squeaks. Um, so many times I get parents who come to me and they say, I took your advice. We went to see um, the, the doctor, and he spent five minutes with us, and he said, your kid doesn't have any risk factors. Please dig deeper. Okay, because I can't twist their arm. All I can do is tell parents, go to the second person, go to the third person, go to the fourth person. And the same thing really with adults. Uh, again, this is real personal for me, and I share this um, a lot with my community. My 23-year-old has sleep apnea and upper airway resistance syndrome, but trying to get it diagnosed is so hard. I mean, she has anxiety, she has depression, she has insomnia, she grinds through a grinding appliance, you know, every few months. She doesn't sleep. She has nightmares. She is a very restless sleeper. Everything going on. We do a sleep study. She has apnea on her back, but when they average it out, then it then she comes in just under, under um, the guideline. The interesting thing is, is that when we met with a different specialist, he said that if she, you know, there's different numbers, there's different parameters. And he said, if she was on, on Medicare, then she would be diagnosed, which just really makes me mad um, that there would be that, you know, inconsistency. But at the end of the day, it, you have to get it figured out. So um, sleep apnea kills people. Complications of sleep apnea, it is the most expensive chronic disease out there. And if you don't want to have lovely things like uh, hypertension and stroke and heart attack and Alzheimer's, I mean, who wants to sign up for that? It's important to take sleep serious. So many of you uh, think, let's talk about kids for a minute. Many of you just think that your kid is normal being naughty. If you have not seen the video Finding Connor Deegan, and I, I encourage you to watch it because it's heartbreaking. I make my students watch it because I feel like if this doesn't piss you off and fire you up, then there's a problem here because sleep apnea changes people. Um, so, so on that note for kids, if you're a parent, if you have a child who has concerns with quality of sleep, if your kid goes to bed and sleeps 14 hours, that's not necessarily normal. That means that they're just not sleeping well, so they're always tired. If your kid wakes with a headache, if they wet the bed, all of those things. Google child sleep, um, sleep apnea symptoms, nightmares, restlessness, all of these things. If your kid sleeps with their head back, we call that the CPR position because they're opening the airway, okay? Um, so adults, let's talk about adults. Many of you just think that it's normal to sleep like crap. And if your body doesn't have rejuvenating deep sleep, it's not restorative, it's not reparative, your cells, your brain, that's when they fix. That's when your body repairs itself is when it's sleeping. And so if you're not a good sleeper, first of all, I want you to get real. Is it your fault? Are you having bad sleep hygiene? Um, I get people who come to me, they want to pay me a fortune to do therapy, but they don't want to stop going to bed at two o'clock and getting up at six. What's the point, right? Um, so bad sleep hygiene. So you have to give your body the opportunity to get eight hours of sleep, seven, eight hours. Um, some people require a little bit more than that. I'm great on seven, but I give my body the opportunity to take at least eight hours of sleep a night if it wants it, okay? 
Um, so snoring, uh, mouth breathing, mouth breathing is sleep disordered breathing. Okay. Um, snoring is not cute, not in kids, not in adults. It affects your partner's sleep. It affects your sleep and your quality of life and your health and your wellness. Uh, you have to figure out why you're snoring. Are you snoring because your tongue is tied down to the floor of your mouth and it's laying in your throat? It's like a shoe. If your jaw doesn't grow properly, uh, your tongue is hanging out in the, in the throat. Like if you had a shoe and you had a, like a clog and your foot was too big, where's your heel going to hang off the back? Okay. Um, waking often, having trouble going back to sleep, having insomnia, you guys, insomnia is telling you something. Your body, if it's awake, it's alive. My daughter goes through this. Her body says, you know what? I'm good. You tried to suffocate me last night. So let's just hang out here and watch another episode of Grey's Anatomy. I'm golden. And so that when people don't sleep, they start to gain weight, lose motivation. They start to have poor diets. I mean, it snowballs. And so when people say, Carmen, you work in wellness, how does all of that connect? How does this tongue relate to the fact that I've gained 30 pounds in the last couple of years? Because I don't sleep, I'm tired, I have no motivation, and I'm depressed. Hello, I think I have explained that. Um, so we talked about tooth grinding. You guys, if you're wearing an appliance, it's not stopping it. It's recording the crime. So, And the crime is your body's 911 call. So the fact that you have an appliance, you're protecting teeth, I totally get that, but dig deeper. What is going on, okay? Um, if you have an appliance that moves your jaw forward, it's a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. It's necessary and it might be helpful, but what else can you be doing? Having the tongue and the roof of the mouth supports the airway. That's what we want. Um, let me see what else here. Um, so we talked about open mouth sleeping. If you have been suggested to take a sleep apnea test and you haven't taken it, you're a fool. Okay. Bar none. I know people 30s, 40s, and 50s. Fit people, firefighters, you name it. I'm not talking overweight, sick people that are dead because of sleep apnea. So if you want to get me fired up, Let's talk about this. You know, I, I'm just so passionate about it. And, and part of that comes from that everybody has just had this blase attitude about sleep, about breathing, about snoring. And I can't do my job if I don't educate you properly and let you know this is not healthy. Okay. And we're talking only about you, but it also affects your, your sleep partner or maybe the other people in the house. Okay. Um, so if you've been told to have a sleep study, if you've been told you have sleep apnea and you're doing nothing about it, you want to tune, tune in here because you have to do something about it. Now, the nice thing is that myofunctional therapy is effective in working with mild to moderate sleep apnea. Uh, people who come to me who have severe apnea, they're always going to be on a CPAP or they're always going to be in therapy. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't do myofunctional therapy because again, going back to those four goals, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't do it, but it just means that I, I would not ever expect them to not have to have a machine. Now, mild to moderate, I have plenty of people who come to me. Uh, I'm even starting to get people referred to me from their doctor who wants them to do myofunctional therapy first before a sleep study. Uh, and so, again, that really, really helps, okay? Um, research will show that it is effective after three months, 30 minutes a day. So when I do therapy with people who have those concerns, I make sure that I spread out that therapy to get into that window so that, um, so that we can see it start to work. And I have literally had clients that will say, Carmen, how long have we, start, how long have we been doing therapy? And I can look in their records and see that it's, three months. And they say, that is so weird. I'm starting to notice, you know, changes A, B, and C. Um, so traditional sleep, you know, or sleep apnea concerns are people who, if you're tired, daytime drowsiness, if you're having accidents at work, um, accidents in the car, um, just 
fatigued in general. You can go out there and find the Epworth sleepiness scale. I include this in all of my kits just again as another as another screening. Um, the f fatigue severity scale is out there. Anything. The bottom line is, is if you sit down and you fall asleep, something's wrong. Okay. If you know that you're not sleeping, let's get to the bottom of that. Uh, headaches, frequent urination, night terrors, night sweats, wakes with a headache. A big one for men, um, that they never want to talk about is sexual disinterest or erectile dysfunction. And what happens is a lot of men just kind of want to put it by the wayside, put it by the wayside. They never want to get their sleep apnea test done. They just don't want to deal with it until they start to have erectile dysfunction issues. That's when they, then when they're ready to be, um, honest about it. So that's a biggie. The other thing is, is frequent urination. So a lot of people will say, well, men will blame it on their prostate. And it's very often not that it's a sleep apnea concern. And then a lot of ladies will say, oh, I, I drink a lot of water or I have a little bladder or blah, blah, blah. Uh, and very often that is the, the irritated bladder, the hormones, all of those things. So I want you to think about that. Could it be that you have that you drink a lot? Yeah, but if you look up the symptoms and or the stuff that I'm saying is resonating with you and you look at this, like look at the rest of the stuff. That's the biggest thing. I get that we don't diagnose something based on one thing alone, which is why it makes me frustrated when I refer somebody to um, an ENT, like I referred a child to an ENT who said, no, you don't have any sleep concerns. Yes, you do have a tongue tie, but because you don't have a speech impediment, you don't need to do anything about it. So frustrating because we don't diagnose anything really these days based on just one thing. It's always digging, digging, digging. Um, so I, I, at this point, if I was doing this this checklist with somebody, then I would be saying, okay, now let's do your functional assessments. So I do all of this knowledge building. I do all of this education. I do all of this digging before I even really start to look in somebody's mouth. People send me pictures. So I get that asked that a lot. Like how, how do you do this virtually Carmen? So I get this information, which gives me a ton of information. We talk about it, digest it. My job is at the end of every exam is to make sure that you don't have questions. And, and that's my job. I, I want to educate you so well that you have no questions, okay? Because I refuse to start therapy with somebody who doesn't know why they need it. They don't see the value in it. And I cannot want it more than you want it. So that is so very important. But at this point, if, if I was working with you, I would now do your functional assessments where I have you do things with your tongue. Um, so that's things like uh, I look to see how the back of the tongue's working, the tip of the tongue, where you can reach, what compensations you have in your neck. Can you suction and hold? How far? Uh, can you stick the tongue out? The, a tongue tie, you guys, really isn't all about the tip of the tongue, which is where a lot of people miss the boat. They, they're more concerned about this. And this is important to me, but you guys, this is what matters. When I have a client whose back of their tongue doesn't even elevate, they can't swallow right. They can't speak right. They choke, you know, all of those things. So, so many people, they look at a tongue tie and they say, oh, it, you know, that freedom is under here. You've got a lot of free tongue, which is what this is called. The, the anterior portion uh, ahead of that insertion of that fiber. Um, but a lot of dentists will say, well, you can stick your tongue out. You're fine. I have clients who have massive tongue ties and they can stick their tongue out fine this way. But down here underneath the tongue, this fiber is three times as thick as it should be. It's half as long as it should be. So it doesn't take rocket science to look at that and say, yeah, it inserts way back here. And a lot of people would call this good, but this doesn't move at all. And that's what makes me so frustrated when people, doctors, providers don't have the expertise or the knowledge to be 
to say that. And so they tell you that you're fine and you're not fine. And so sometimes I'm going against, you know, somebody, I have a client and they say, well, the doctor said I'm fine. And I say, well, your doctor is wrong. So that pits us against each other. And so for doctors, when when they reach out to me and want to want to know how to more understand, that's what I tell them is don't give bad advice. Don't paralyze the person. Help them understand that there may be a concern. And if you're not comfortable answering the questions, then you have to refer them to somebody who can. Don't scare them. Don't freak them out because the path of least resistance for people who are overwhelmed is to do nothing. And I get so many people that say, yeah, I knew about this five years ago, but they freaked me out. So I did nothing about it. So that's why, that's why I travel and speak and talk about this stuff because for every one dentist who understands what I do, why, why it's so important. There's, there's 10 more probably who don't even look for tongue ties. Um, they know what a tongue tie is because they learned about it in school uh, will they release it for you? Absolutely. I've got a Tyrannosaurus Rex laser in the back with four inches of dust on it. I'll dust it off and we'll do your procedure. No, because they're not going to do it right. Okay. Um, so when it comes to finishing this exam with somebody, we look at those functional assessments. They give me the rest of the picture, but honestly, most of the time I'm saying like, 95% of the time, before I even get to that point with somebody, I'm looking at this form. I'm looking at the information that they've given me. I already know whether they have the symptoms and the signs that support having a tongue tie without even looking. And, and I love it. I love that challenge for myself of being able to challenge and say, yeah, this person has a tie before I even look at their pictures. So it's super important. Um, I That is all I have going through this. Um, what this means for you is it just gives you an insight into how all of this stuff is connected. It's not just one thing. It's not just one symptom. It's not just a tongue thrust. It's not just a speech impediment. It's not just that you can't lick an ice cream cone without it hurting. It's all of those other compensations. And the most important time to start myofunctional therapy is early, okay? The sooner the better, because trust me, when you're 60, 70, pushing 80, you know, it, it is so hard. It takes so much elbow grease and it's you've been doing it wrong for so long that that, that makes it such a challenge. So... Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end this. Thank you so much for letting me to speak, letting me speak with you today and educate you on this. Hopefully next year we are not in this uh, scary, weird time and I will be back speaking with you live because this um, this is something that I do every year. I think I've done it every year for the past three or four years. So I love coming to speak to you guys. Um, I'm going to let you get out of here. You know where to find me. You can find me in the Tongue Tie and Myofunctional Therapy Support Group if you have questions. You can go to my website, which is myo Myofunctional Therapy for You, and that's the number four, the letter U, um, dot com. Tons of information there. It has all of my information about prices and all of that stuff, and I know that's not why we're talking here today, but if you're curious, um, if you're going to continue your expertise in this field, and then um, YouTube. So YouTube has a lot of information. And then my blog, which is also on the website. You can also find me on every uh, social, on most social media channels. So uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad this turned out easy doing this virtual lecture. And I will see you guys next year. Mm -hmm.